record. Okay, so uh, we have been talking about nuclear magnetic resonance, and we've been doing this because this is how we know what structures we've made. Um, so far, all of you have accepted on faith that the reactions I presented to you are actually real, which is good. I'm not intentionally trying to deceive you, but um, you can't just draw a reaction on a sheet of paper and submit it to a journal and say, yay, look what we did. Uh, the scientific community says, prove it, and so we're trying to learn how you prove it. Um, we've learned how to get the right molecular weight from mass spectrometry. We've learned how to get uh, key functional groups from infrared spectroscopy, but we've still uh, struggled to get connectivity. Uh, and so NMR is going to give us the connectivity of a molecule. We talked about last time how the phenomenon comes from um, the fact that protons uh, and C13 isotope nuclei uh, can be viewed, of, be viewed as little magnets. And we talked about how in the presence of an external magnetic field, there's a difference between spin states where you're aligned with versus against the field. And a radio frequency uh, radiation can cause a proton nucleus to transition between aligned with versus aligned against the field. We can detect the absorbance of that radio frequency and uh, we can use that radio frequency for key information. Now last time uh, I told you that among the, inf so we talked about the origin of chemical shift. I'm not going to go into that other than to remind you that this is related to the frequency at which a proton undergoes that transition. Uh, the thing about PPM is just to get it in units that are convenient to display. But larger values of uh, chemical shift mean a particular proton has a higher energy gap between spin states. And we'll talk about uh, why that might be. All right, I showed you a typical NMR spectrum uh, where you have chemical shift on the x-axis. Basically on the y-axis you have absorbance. Uh, we talked about how uh, the, among the pieces of information you can get from this experiment, uh, first is that identical protons show up with the same NMR signal uh, or same resonance signal or same uh, NMR peak. We talked about how the area under an NMR peak, which you can integrate in arbitrary peak units, and as I say, it's totally arbitrary. Back in the day before we had computers to integrate, you could, if you really wanted to, actually cut out the peak and weigh it and then do the same thing for the other peaks, and that would be roughly the same way. Uh, in any case, the area under the peak is directly proportional to how many protons are accounted for by that peak. It's just a ratio thing, so at first we don't know whether uh, there are two to three to three protons under these peaks or uh, represented by these peaks or whether it's four to six to six or some other multiple. We just know the ratio. If you know the molecular formula though, you can pretty well figure it out, right? I have eight protons in my sample, so it certainly can't be four plus six plus six, which would be 16, but it can be two plus three plus three, all right? And, uh, Already, we're getting enough information to solve some of the connectivity issues. Uh, at the end of last time, we talked about how one of the most common ways to have two identical protons is a CH2 group. Uh, one of the most common ways to have three identical protons is a CH3 group. So um, already you're beginning to see sort of uh, the types of structures that can be indicated by these peaks. Uh, we talked about how the shape of the peaks gives you more information for connectivity. Uh, for example, this one to three to three to one quartet. Uh, you don't know this yet, but I told you it represents a proton that's adjacent to three other protons. Yes? Can you go over one more time what it means for hydrogen to be in a singlet if it were a quartet? Yep, getting there, yep. So uh, peak shape, one peak is a singlet. If there were two side by side in a one to one ratio, it'd be a doublet, this is a triplet, this is a quartet. Um, I'll explain how that process arises. 
Uh, but for now, you can interpret it pretty easily by uh, knowing that if a peak is a quartet, that means whatever protons are represented by this peak are adjacent to three other protons. And, and the pattern of peaks, at least their intensities or uh, peak areas, are related to Pascal's triangle. So if you have one adjacent proton, you have a one-to-one -one doublet. If you have two adjacent protons, you have a one-to-two-to-one -to -one triplet. If you have three adjacent protons, you have a one-to-three-to-three-to-one -to -three -to -three -to quartet. Okay. What do I mean by adjacent? I mean uh, protons that are three bonds away. So um, the peak here that is a quartet is one, two, the protons represented by that quartet must be three bonds away from three other protons. Okay, yes? Can we also know that on the other side there cannot be any protons on the... Exactly, yes, that's a great point. Because this is a quartet and only a quartet, we must know that whatever the mystery atom is here, it does not have protons on it. Yeah, good. So you're using all the information you have to narrow in on what the structure is and to eliminate alternative possibilities. Uh, again, the peak shape here alone tells you that uh, whatever protons are represented by this peak are adjacent to three and only three other protons, okay? And again, I'm gonna explain how that happens, but you don't need to know how it happens or why it happens to be able to use that information. Now, um, let's do a little bit of prediction. If this quartet tells us that we have a CH2 group that's adjacent to three other protons, that might be a methyl group, then we ought to be able to find a peak in this spectrum that represents three protons, and it ought to show a shape that would indicate it is adjacent to two, right? What is the peak shape for something that's adjacent to two protons? One to two to one triplet, right? So we ought to find somewhere in this spectrum a one to two to one triplet uh, that integrates for three protons, or rather has a three to two ratio with respect to this peak. So let's have a look. Aha, ah, right there, there it is. There is our one to two to one triplet. It integrates for 30 arbitrary peak units, which relative to this is consistent with basically a three to two ratio. NMR, ha the spectra has to be internally self-consistent. This is one of the ways you can, uh, if you're thoughtful and systematic about how you deal with these problems, you can correct your mistakes all along because um, some of you will give up too early and just say whatever and write down some structure, but if you take enough time, you will see if your answer is incorrect, there will be things about your structure that are not consistent with the spectrum. The structure and the spectrum have to be internally consistent. So if we want, we can label these peaks A and protons B. So we know which peaks represent which protons. Um, now that we know a little bit about how the splitting of the peak, peak splitting is what this quartet, doublet or singlet is called, now we know a little bit about what that means. What does that tell you for the three protons represented by this peak? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had a question too, but okay, back they, either way. Is it just paired gray and shielded? Okay, shielded versus deshielded is the chemical shift issue. Let's get to your question. What was it? Yes, good question, because you'll often find that the integrated peak areas are not exact in terms of their ratios, so we're talking about one significant figure here. 
Yeah? Sure. Okay, no adjacent protons for splitting, which means this peak, we'll call it C, represents a methyl group, and we don't know what the methyl group is bonded to, but whatever this mystery atom is, there are no protons on it. Okay? So if you look at what we have done so far, we have accounted for a CH2 group, a methyl group, and another methyl group. <coughs> Not only that, we know the CH2 and the CH3 are attached together, so this is now an ethyl group. By the way, a three to two pattern of peaks that are a quartet and triplet respectively is consistent with an ethyl group. Go ahead. When you say adjacent, is that adjacent in like different ways or can you define that? What do we mean by adjacent? I mean within three bonds. So uh, for example, this is just a for instance, Suppose you have I don't know, isopropanol. That proton there is adjacent to six other protons. Because six other protons are within three bonds. Ah, uh, yes, why am I not worrying about the oxygen one? Fine, we'll say seven. I'll tell you later on why sometimes you don't have to worry about oxygen, but it's a little too complicated right now, so fine. Seven adjacent protons. And you're just counting from the carbon? Just from the carbon that has the proton on it, yeah. So if, if the carbon that has the proton you're interested in is called alpha, then you're looking for beta protons. Always looking for beta protons, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you'd expect that peak to be pretty complicated, actually. Sometimes if you get beyond a quartet, there are other characteristic patterns, but often they get too messy to interpret. Um, in any case, yeah, we're, talk we're looking for, uh, by adjacent, I mean within three bonds. All right. Now, um, in general, Splitting doesn't happen between identical protons. And it doesn't happen between protons that are on the same carbon, usually. Uh, so for this CH2 group, where the protons are on the same carbon, notice that um, I only see the quartet here. I don't see anything that might indicate, oh, this proton is adjacent to these, and it also shares the carbon with another proton. Two identical protons generally don't split with each other. Don't know why, it's physics. Um, okay. All right, so we've got some pieces here. Um, let's try to account for all of the carbons and the hydrogens. Let's see, we've accounted for two plus three plus three, that's eight hydrogens. We got that. How many carbons have we accounted for? Well, we haven't seen the carbons, but we can tell they're there because we know that protons have to be attached to carbons. So we've got one, two, and three. We're missing one, okay? We're missing a carbon. And we're also, so we've got three of four, uh, and we're missing two oxygens. Now, we happen to know that we have to have a carbon-oxygen double bond here because of the infrared spectrum. Remember that? So that would account for our other missing carbon. One of them is in the carbonyl group. And it would account for one of our two missing oxygens. All right, so let's just, again, draw the pieces of the puzzle that we're seeing so far. The squiggly line represents what el uh, the place that we don't know what it is on the other side. So here's our ethyl group. Here's our methyl group. That accounts for everything except one oxygen. And who knows what that's bonded to. <coughs> OK, so then I can start to come up with some structural hypotheses. Um, all right, so one, you've got to put these together in ways that make sense. 
let's just consider the possibilities. One might be to do this. Put the ethyl group attached to the carbonyl carbon, uh, then an oxygen, and then um, a CH3 group. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another alternative would be to put the methyl group attached to the carbonyl carbon with the ethyl group attached to the oxygen of the ester. Um, why couldn't I do this? What's wrong with this? Inconsistent with the pattern of splitting, right? What would you predict for this pattern? Singlet. Singlet, singlet, singlet. No adjacent protons. So check, always check your structural hypothesis against the data. This is what it means to be a scientist. And if the data are not consistent with your hypothesis, then you need to find a different explanation. All right. Can't be this one because of uh, singlets. Now, you've got two possibilities, and we can go through and check and see, would we see the pattern of splitting for each of these? Yes, you would predict a triplet for this methyl group. I'm going to use a T to represent triplet. You would expect a quartet, Q, for the CH2 group. And you would expect a singlet, S, for the CH3 group. Similarly, you would expect a singlet here, a quartet here, and a triplet there. So splitting pattern alone doesn't distinguish between these two. Yes? Aren't those two the same molecule, just rotated? No, they are not the same molecule, just rotated. The ethyl group here is attached to the carbonyl carbon. In this case, the methyl is. We've swapped the places of the end groups. All right. So splitting alone isn't going to give us the answer. Instead, we now have to consider uh, chemical shift information. All right. So how does chemical shift help us distinguish one of these options versus the other? And to do this, we need to back up just a little bit and uh, talk about where chemical shift comes from in the first place. And you know what? I feel like I'm in the wrong presentation. Hmm. What are we going to do about that? Duplicate is what we're going to do about that. OK. Add page. So let's talk about uh, what information chemical shift gives us. And the basic idea is the chemical shift of a proton is highly dependent on environment. All right, so uh, to understand this, you need to know just a little bit about what happens to electrons in the presence of an external magnetic field. So here is your proton nucleus. And in sort of blue is the cloud of electrons that are surrounding that proton nucleus. In the presence of an external magnetic field, which we are calling B0, um, what happens to charged particles in a magnetic field? They move, and in a circular path, or some kind of circulating path, right? So um, I'm going to get all of the, if you're in physics now, or, and, and I can't remember whether it's the 121, 122, or 2, whatever, 20. At some point, you learn about uh, electricity and magnetism. You learn right-handed rules for which direction the electrons circulate in, depending on the magnetic field. I have forgotten those rules. I don't really care very much about those rules. So as I'm drawing here, if I violate those rules, um, I do so with full knowledge and not caring. So don't tell me about it. Can I do that on the exam? Uh, yes. <laughs> See how that goes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So let's assume that the electrons start circulating in uh, the external, in the presence of this external magnetic field. They move in a pattern 
that generates its own magnetic field, right? Circulating electrons themselves move. And it gets weirder because current is backwards from electron movement. Thank you, Benjamin Franklin, right? So um, the, the motion of the electrons generates what's called an induced magnetic field, which we're going to call little b with the subscript i for induced. Okay, and uh, if we draw the field lines for that, they would tend to look like this. And notice that at the nucleus, those field lines oppose the external magnetic field. Right? So at the nucleus, the total uh, field that the proton experiences is equal to the external magnetic field. And in this case, we're subtracting the induced magnetic field. Do you get it? Because the presence of electrons in some ways shields the proton from the external magnetic field. Okay? So what would this tend to do? Remember that the overall difference in energy that you experience, uh, that, uh, that, that a proton get experiences when it, uh, between the aligned versus not aligned spin states is related to um, the field that the proton experiences. And that itself is related to the frequency that the proton resonates at, which is related to the chemical shift. So a proton in an electron-rich environment will tend to be shielded from the external magnetic field. Shielded protons or protons in electron-rich environments tend to be shielded from the external magnetic field or have a smaller difference in energy between spin states have a lower frequency of transition and therefore a lower chemical shift. Okay, so we can now go back to our spectrum and say, okay, things with lower chemical shift tend to be in electron rich environments. So, um, and tend to be shielded. Uh, electrons that are uh, at higher chemical shift tend to be in electron poor environments. And we will call that de-shielded. Okay? So as an example of this principle, if you compare the chemical shifts of say uh, a methyl, the protons in methanol, or sorry, methane, uh, you would expect the chemical shift of this proton to be, I'm guessing, around one ppm. What could we do to make that proton less electron rich? Well, you can incorporate electronegative, electronegative groups nearby. So let's put uh, an OH group nearby. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Therefore, you sort of expect there to be individual bond dipoles like this with the protons being more electron poor and the chemical shift for a proton that's adjacent uh, or on an alpha carbon that's attached to an oxygen tends to be in the three to four ppm region for chemical shift, okay? So we call, we say that the oxygen, the nearby oxygen de-shields the proton. Um, this effect tapers off the further away you get from the, from the oxygen. So for example, um, if you had, say, propanol here, you'd expect these protons to be in the three to four ppm area. 
these would be somewhere between one and one and three probably being beta to an oxygen probably gets you in the around two ppm chemical shift by the time you get to the gamma carbon you're back to normal sort of the effect of the electron withdrawing group tapers off with distance yeah Right, ppm is a, a unit of frequency. It's normalized and adjusted such that we're no longer dealing with scientific notation or decimals. And it's for, uh, it's for like it's for the it's the frequency at which a proton transitions from aligned with to aligned against the magnetic field. Okay. Yep. But normalized for a bunch of stuff again because we don't want to deal with scientific notation or really large decimals. Okay, so shielded versus deshielded. Uh, the presence of an oxygen, uh, other things that will do sort of what oxygen does uh, in terms of deshielding, the halides, um, a nitrogen, anything that tends to be more electronegative than carbon, uh, if oxygen, if it's adjacent to the proton, that proton will be deshielded. There are tables in your NMR, or in your text, and I will give you some on the exam that describe the types of chemical shifts typically observed for organic molecules. So um, what you're seeing so far is that in terms of chemical shift, alkyl protons tend to be in the chemical shift area of sort of 1 to 2 ppm. So... Uh, a methyl group uh, at the, on a primary carbon ends up being around one. Uh, protons on a secondary carbon end up being around 1.3. Protons on a tertiary carbon end up being around 1.7. It's generally not useful to know or memorize this because you can usually tell whether a proton is primary, secondary, or tertiary simply by integrated peak area, right? Um, three protons, two protons, one proton. Um, okay, what about, we've talked about being uh, alpha to an electronegative heteroatom, oxygen, and nitrogen halides. Uh, what about being alpha to a pi bond? So, for example, if you're a proton that is alpha to a carbonyl carbon, one that's involved in a carbon-oxygen pi bond, uh, you expect to be around uh, a range between 1.5 and 2.5 ppm. So this would be true even if you had a functional group that you don't know about yet. It's called an imine, and you'll learn more about it in 352. Being alpha to a carbonyl, alpha to an imine, um, actually even being alpha to just your run-of-the-mill pi bond gets you into this area too, and being alpha to a benzene ring also, uh, or even alpha to an alkyne, an alkyne proton. All, all, all of these are alpha to a double bond, a pi bond, and they all tend to show up in this area where if the atom that's involved in the pi bond is more electronegative, then you're looking at probably more on the two to two and a half ppm range. You have to memorize that because uh, that's going to be in a table. There are a couple of other situations to be aware of. Um, shoot. But actually, let's, let's pause on that because we now have enough information to go back to our spectrum. Here were our structural hypotheses. And uh, we had hypothesis one and hypothesis two. Let's look at what the data say. The proton that is, the protons that are represented, or the CH2 group protons are here, 
ATPA, and their chemical shift is around four. Based on what I told you, do you have enough information to distinguish between one and two? Okay, what's the reasoning? What would you expect for protons that are alpha to an oxygen? Three to four or more deshielded. What about protons here that are alpha to a carbonyl group? You expect one and a half to 2.5 ppm. What do we see? More like three or four. So that, auto, that rules out option one because option one is inconsistent with the chemical shift data. So this is our structure. We have solved it. Now, uh, we haven't looked at the other two peaks, but we can. Uh, we said that the singlet represents a CH3 group that's uh, not attached, that, that doesn't have any adjacent protons. Its chemical shift is around two. That is consistent with what we expect for something that is alpha to a carbonyl carbon. We would expect one and a half to two ppm. So that peak is right where it should be. And then the methyl group that is beta to the, carb to the oxygen, we expect that to be maybe in the one ppm area overall. And that's sort of where it shows up. Okay, so the chemical shift is going to be uh, useful in distinguishing between multiple possibilities. Now, there's these, notice that I'm giving you ranges, not exact values. Uh, all of this is highly environment sensitive. So don't get hung up over whether an alkyl methyl group is exactly 1 or 1 1.2. That difference is probably not meaningful. But the difference between 1 and 2 ppm is meaningful. And of course, the difference between 2 and 3 or 4 is meaningful as well. Okay. Questions about how we did that? Yeah. What made our CH2 group go to four? The fact that, what made the CH2 group go to four? The fact that it is on a carbon, the protons are on a carbon attached or alpha to an electronegative atom. They are de-shielded. Okay. Um, right, so there's some explanations as to why being alpha to a pi bond is de-shielding. Uh, they're not worth knowing, at least not at this stage. Um, I want to show you a couple of other proton situations that are common in organic molecules. Um, what if instead of being alpha to a pi bond, what if you're on a carbon that's actually involved in a pi bond? Vinyl CHs. I'm talking about protons that are on uh, vinyl carbons, that is carbons involved in pi bonds, you're looking at around four to six ppm. Okay, so these are vinyl or olefin CHs. Um, one preview, if these two vinyl protons are not identical, that is if there's different things here, R versus R prime, then they can uh, split each other. And splitting that, is in, splitting that involves two protons on the same carbon is generally larger than splitting uh, that involves protons on adjacent carbons. Um, protons that are on amid nitrogens, I'm saying this because amid nitrogens are a, f a part of the backbone of every protein in, that we know of. These tend to have chemical shifts in the seven to eight ppm region. If you're attached to a benzene ring, this tends to have a chemical shift in the seven to eight ppm region. There's a reason for that. Uh, they are more de-shielded than you would expect for a vinyl proton, right? Vinyl proton on an sp2 hybridized carbon. The being attached to a benzene ring is basically the analogous situation, but you're de-shielded for a benzene ring relative to the vinyl protons. The reason for this has again to do with induced current. 
uh, and an induced magnetic field. But the fact that the benzene ring is cyclic means that electrons can circulate in a larger pathway than just around a given nucleus. If this is your external magnetic field, what happens is that um, the electrons, and I'm going to use, you know, here's a cloud of pi electrons above the plane of the ring and below the plane of the ring. Uh, in the presence of an external magnetic field, those pi electrons circulate and they generate the following field lines inside the ring or at the, on the face of the ring. These field lines oppose the external magnetic field. But out here where the protons are, they reinforce the external magnetic field. So it just so happens because of the cyclic nature of the ring and the way the electrons are able to circulate, the external magnetic field, uh, the field that is experienced by this proton is equal to the external magnetic field plus the induced magnetic field. Larger experienced magnetic field means larger delta E, larger frequency, larger chemical shift and be shielded. All right? Yes? Is that just when it rotates away from the external magnetic field? Uh, the external magnetic field causes the electrons in the benzene ring to circulate in a way that opposes the external magnetic field. Protons on a benzene ring always have that de-shielded feature. So what causes the, the external flux? Uh, the location, so, um, Notice that, let's see, let me just copy what we did before. It, uh, the principle is the same. It induced, uh, induced electric current generates an induced magnetic field. The location of the proton relative to the magnetic field uh, that's induced is the difference here. See that the proton is in the middle here where the field is opposed, uh, where the external magnetic field is opposed by the induced magnetic field. For the benzene ring, the, pro the, the electrons are circulating not just around one proton, but around the whole molecule. And now the protons that we're looking at are on the outside where the field lines reinforce the external field. All right, so uh, benzene protons tend to be de-shielded. Uh, yeah, so what would happen if you put something, if you were able to somehow put, oops, some group here on the face of the benzene ring where it could experience uh, shielding? That's a lovely question and one that we could spend a lot of time talking about. Um, I will say, do you remember uh, learning in chapter three about the cation pi interaction? That is that the face of a benzene ring is electron rich and cations can be attracted to it. Um, in some, uh, well, there's, you can do an experiment where you take uh, a lysine side chain in a peptide and you put it somewhere where it will pack against I'm sorry, you don't want to know this, um, but I'm telling you anyway. I'm yeah, well, you asked, right? Serves you right. As my son Jack used to say when he was little, that's your deservement. <laughs> okay, sure. Sure, buddy. Um, so here is an aromatic ring of the side chain tryptophan. Here is a positively charged amino acid side chain lysine. There's a cation pi interaction where the lysine hovers over the benzene ring. If you measure the chemical shift of these protons, they're in this area, and these protons too, they're in this area where they should be shielded from the external magnetic field by circulation 
of the current in the ring. So yeah, these protons show, show, actually show up in an NMR spectrum way at lower chemical shift than they should. Yep. OK. There's some more things about aldehydes um, and carboxylic acids, which I don't think we need to necessarily say. Um, Right. In the last couple of minutes, I want to just start you on understanding where splitting comes from. So we're going to imagine a simple situation where you have two protons, A and B. They are non-identical and adjacent to each other, and we don't care about <coughs> excuse me, what the other stuff in the molecule is. So um, notice that in the presence of an external magnetic field, each of these protons can have one of two spin states. We're going to pretend that we are proton A, and we're going to, I'm going to tell you what we see as proton A. There are two spin states available to proton A, one aligned with the magnetic field, one against. And I told you last time that the energy difference between those two is small enough that you basically have a 50-50 ratio between the two. That means that in half of all situations, proton A has a proton next to it that's aligned with the magnetic field. In half of all situations, proton A has proton B next to it that's against the magnetic field. In other words, the field experienced by proton A is equal to two different things. You've got two options. One is B plus be aligned with the magnetic field. The other is be with uh, the small influence of the adjacent magnet against the magnetic field. Now that difference, the difference, uh, the effect of that adjacent proton is small because it's a tiny little magnet. But both of these situations are present in a 50-50 ratio. So what we would observe for the frequency, for the peak associated with proton A is not a single peak, but we're going to observe a doublet. That is a peak where half of the protons have an adjacent proton aligned with the field and half have an adjacent proton aligned against the field. Okay? That's where splitting occurs. If you want, we can, I can show you how we get a triplet from having two adjacent protons, but I won't do that today. So... Happy Good Friday to all of you. Happy Easter. I will see you Monday.